I do appreciate you folks showing up. It's a lot easier to preach to people than empty pews. So I appreciate you making the right choice to be a part of what God's doing in our midst. Of course, the church folks, they should be here. It shouldn't be kind of a question, are we coming tonight or are we not going tonight? No, God's ordered this up. It's just a good opportunity and a privilege to be a part of more preaching concerning Jesus. But we're sure thankful in a, even, uh, maybe even a greater way as such, for those folks that are, are visitors. And they still want to come here and be a part of this church and again see what God's doing in our midst. Well, let's go ahead and bow our heads and hearts. Let's ask God to help us. Then we'll look at the challenge of the hour. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for the great time we had yesterday around the Word of God, the fellowship downstairs afterwards. Lord, I, I'm always blessed. I'm always thankful when I come to this church. Lord, I just feel so loved and appreciated. And Lord, that's very encouraging to my heart. But Lord, tonight as we look further into your Word and, and get another lesson from you, God, I pray again you'll just help us to be attentive, help us to listen carefully, help us to receive these truths to our hearts. But Lord, help us to commit tonight, whether it's coming forward or parked there in the pew, to commit to put these into practice sooner than later. Lord, I know what's coming. I know there are many good lessons to learn and be reminded of. So God, help us again just to be very faithful in this opportunity you've blessed us with tonight. Now, God, whether it's via technology or folks here in this auditorium tonight, if they don't know for sure they're going to heaven, not sure they're a Christian, Lord, help them realize they can nail that down. They can know that they know that Jesus is their personal Savior, that they're on their way to heaven for all eternity. And, oh, God, help them tonight to receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior. So, Lord, I know you're looking to do a work in every heart, and, God, I know you never disappoint. So again, we look unto Jesus and look for you to have your hand on this meeting and to do a great work in our midst. We praise you and thank you now, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, for those who weren't with us last night uh, physically or even by uh, internet or whatever the case may be, we talked about a needed commodity today like I've never seen. We talked about last night having that God-given wisdom or what we call discernment. Known the good guys from the bad guys. How to make good, better, and best choice and differentiate three. But again, not just knowing what's right, but kind of getting caught up with wisdom on high to know what's almost right. Remember that quote from even Spurgeon last night? You know, that's what God's looking to bring to our hearts and lives. Well, tonight we're going after another missing commodity in the world that's before us. And the sad and sorry thing to say, this is missing in a lot of lives in local churches. And, and people that truly know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. But what are you going after tonight, preacher? Well, I want to give a representation or a testimony concerning integrity. Do you think folks need that in Washington, D.C.? Yeah. You with me? Are you can amen. You know, it's true. You think it's not just car dealers, sorry, Connie, or, uh, or lawyers that need a dose of good integrity? No, folks, we as believers need to think through our testimony. Are we a testimony of integrity? Now, I'm going to give you a good definition I found. I looked at Barry. I wasn't sure if I preached this last time I was here or some other time. So Barry has a tendency, irritation to an evangelist. He writes down in his Bible quotes and stuff and, and again, puts the date there. So I got his Bible and started going through. Either he was asleep, he didn't show up. Or he didn't think it was worth writing down. But uh, I want to give you something worth writing down. It's the definition of integrity that I got years ago when I worked at the Wilds Camp and Conference Center. Let me give it to you. I'll give it to you several times. But I'm telling you, folks, this is one of the best I've heard. Integrity is complete obedience. We can just preach on that the rest of the night. Complete obedience regardless of who is watching. The intensity of the temptation or the severity of the pressure. Isn't that good? Let me go again. Listen to it as I give it, hopefully, in a clear fashion. Integrity is complete obedience, regardless of who is watching, the intensity of the temptation, or the severity of the pressure. Now, I'm a bottom, bottom line guy, as far as understanding is concerned, and I, I like to put the hay down where even I can understand it and partake of. You know what this means, just summed up? Just simply looking to do what's right. I don't care if it's tax time. 
I don't care if it puts another bit of coin in the banking account. I don't care if, again, it's something that gets you in a progressive way as far as the world's concerned. No, as a believer, folks, you should always looking to do what's right. Now, what I'm going to show you tonight is what I call the poster child of integrity. From a teenager all the way through his, in his adult representation, he set forth a testimony of integrity. Now, I don't know if you do this every year. I've been seeking again, as I do, to read through the Bible. And how enjoyable was it for me to read again the life of Joseph? I mean, the guy was, again, just faced with so many difficult trials and tribulations, but he didn't make excuses based on circumstances. He just simply made a choice to please and honor God, and that happens when you simply do what's right. Let me give that definition again. I saw something right as fast as you could, and I know you got it. Integrity is complete obedience, regardless of who is watching, the intensity of the temptation, or the severity of the pressure. Where do we start with this? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 37. Would you please take the Bibles, go there. And I'm going to read the verses. If you don't have yours with you, please don't be embarrassed. But go to Genesis 37, and let's just unfold this story together, again, about this poster child of integrity testimony. Now, I'm thankful old Joe, he didn't make excuses along the way, but, but he had reason to do so as far as the flesh. Now, let me give a summary and a reminder. He's the son of Jacob and Rachel, has 11 brothers, but just one full brother. And of course, we know that's Benjamin. So dad, having several wives, a bunch of half brothers and sisters, this was a home, no doubt, filled with strife. You know what we call this today? A dysfunctional home. But let me give you a statement. Joseph didn't use a tough home life as an excuse to do wrong. Happens, doesn't it? If I wasn't married to old Herbert, I'd be a more godly woman. If I didn't have that nagging machine that I'm stuck with, you know, because I'm a Christian, I no, you do wrong because you choose to do wrong. Do you know why he did right and he did right most of the time, if not all the time? Because here it is. Watch, watch this. Pleasing God was more important than pleasing himself. Now, I don't know if that's a battle for you, but it is for me because I like me way too much. But again, when you're faced with a temptation, an opportunity of compromise, an opportunity of defilement, will you let your governing choices be pleasing God more important than pleasing self? So here's the outline for tonight if you want to take some notes. First of all, we'll see he's greatly loved. And well, first of all, we'll see greatly loved by his father. Now, I did see this marked in your Bible. So you've heard this passage before, no doubt, Mary. But in chapter 37 and verse 3, it says this. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age and made him a coat of many colors. Now, here's the irritation factor of the coat of many colors. That's usually given to the older sibling. You know, representing leadership. But God is honoring this guy through his father because, again, of his character, his love for God, and just simply, again, choosing to do what's right. So he had, a, again, a, a, a love for Jacob, and, and they had a mutual love concerning mom and, you know, and each other and, and even, even God. Now, see, I, I preach to teens all the time. You know, there are a lot of teens that don't get loved the way they should be loved. Y'all hear me? And, and I was spoiled as a kid. I didn't like my parents. Can you imagine that, teenagers? I liked my parents, even as an unsaved kid. And I always wanted to be pleasing in their sight. But I had a special relationship with my dad. Now, I'm, I'm Bobby Jr. He's more of a Costco size. Y'all with me? <laughs> okay. He was a big boy. And, and I'm more of a skinny mini as far as the comparison. But as far as the bald comb dome and the obnoxious personality and real loud, <laughs> Pete and repeat to say the least. But Dad and I had a lot of common things we enjoyed to do. We, we both loved to fish. I mean, we've been up in the, you know, trout fishing out in Colorado. We've been down to, you know, flying back into Canada to do all kinds of walleye fishing. I mean, we just did that together. We both enjoyed it. But we also had a mutual love for mom. I'm a mama's boy. I've told you that. But, but, but we loved each other, but we loved each other more so in Christ Jesus. We both wanted to please our God. 
So a very special relationship. So he's greatly loved by his earthly father, but he's also obviously greatly loved by his heavenly father. Several times in this passage, it says this phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. Now let me help you with that particular testimony. You know why that happened, people? You know why there was a testimony that was so obvious? Because Joseph was looking to be with God. Everywhere Joseph went, he was conscious of God's ever-present observation already caught. You with me? And also the opportunity to please and bring a, t a testimony that helps God, that again reflects in the eyes and heart of God in a pleasing fashion. And I want to ask you a question. Shouldn't that be us? You know, God... And this is, this is so ridiculous to think of when you really think this through. God longs to have fellowship with you all the time. Isn't that amazing? God, the creator of all, wants to have 24-7 ever-present fellowship with you. And what do we do most of the time? We ignore him. You know, it says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. You know what I've got after that phrase? Wow. How, how in the world are we again so foolish in the flesh to bypass the all-knowing God who simply wants to bring what's needed and best for our life to take us where we need to go to accomplish what he saved and called us to do? And you think your way, your thoughts, your schedule is more important than acknowledging that ever present help and fellowship with God. Folks, how dumb can Christians be? Can we all say real dumb? <laughs> I say real dumb. And real foolish, folks, especially when we don't buy up that 24-7 available fellowship with our God. So pretty clear of it. He's greatly loved, but he's also greatly hated. Look down at this point. Look at verse 4. What's the first example? Well, it was his brothers. Probably everybody but Benjamin, to say the least. It says, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. You parents, have you learned that's not a good thing to do? <laughs> you know, I mean, it happens. You know, I'm the favorite in my family. And it always <laughs> caused problems with my brothers and sister, my brother, brothers and sister, when they just, it's, and it's still obvious today. You know, dad left everything to me. You know, mom, I, she tells the other people, please, you don't need to come because Mike's here. <laughs> and it's you know, just that way. But you know, if you're a good parent, you don't let the other kids know that you like this one or this one's more fun to parent than others. I'll tell you right now, my old son was a pain in my parenting flesh. Do with me? Now, I love him just as much, but I wanted to slap him most of the time. Because I'd say it's black, he said it's white, I say it's white, he said black. And boy, was he a problem as far as parenting is concerned. I want to kill the kid half the time. But you know what? Good parenting kind of balances the act, don't they? But old Jacob, he didn't do that. He showed very obviously, and that stirred up stuff as far as the brothers are concerned. Now, why did they hate him? Well, we see jealousy in verse 4. But go down with me at verse 11. This stuff called envy. And he says his brothers, his brethren envied him, but his father observed his saying. What saying? Now, this, how, would this, how would this work between you and your siblings? You tell your siblings, hey, you know, guys, one of these days, you guys are going to bow down and kiss my big toe. You're going to fall down. He didn't say big toe. But you're going to fall down. I would have killed my little brothers. Or we would have had a pound party. Wouldn't it have been that way in your home? Well, the guy didn't take that truth, the revelation God brought to old Joe. But dad observed those sayings. So think this through. Dad showing favoritism. They think the brothers are snitch. Do you remember that part when they went down to old Shechem down there and, and uh, dad says, hey, you need to go check on the boys, Joe. Now they already want to slap him upside the head, but he goes down there and, and does he tell on him because he's a snitch? No, from the character representation, I believe he's just test, uh, protecting the testimony of the family as well as the testimony for their God. And again, it goes on to say they hated him more and more down in verse 5. So what happens, the brothers go off to work again, and Joseph stays home with dad, and I'm sure the guys were thinking, and his precious little coat. 
And again, this is hard to deal with, especially if you're not looking to please God or thinking again what God's honored by. So what happens? Well, hatred goes a sideways direction to say the least. Wrong thoughts, if not dealt with, will lead to wrong actions. Did y'all catch that? Well, what did we hear last night? When I'm thinking right, Pastor gave testimony. He was under conviction all day long. He was dink, dinking and think, thinking all day long concerning the Saul. But you know what? Are you concerned about that? Because if you don't get this brain in focus spiritually, it'll lead to some of the dumbest sinful thoughts and if not dealt with choices that will just obliterate your testimony. And again, not showing that which will honor and please our God. So again, Joe, Jacob sends old Joe down to check on the boys that supposedly are back down in Shechem, but he finds out they went down to Dothan instead. But let me show you that here in the passage. Look down with me in verse 17. And the man said, a guy, of course, that Joe inquired, had you seen the boys? It said, they departed hence, and I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brother and found them in Dothan. Well, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, now, you think this was still a burr under their ever-loving saddle? Yeah, yeah, Joe and his testimony, yeah, keep reading. And they conspired against him to slay him. Now, I don't know what your family reunions, you, reunions are like, but this ain't a good choice. Y'all with me? Yeah, we're going to family reunion. We're going to go kill everybody. You're a wacko gourd. And again, these guys were not in spiritual mindedness, and now they're going to the point of even murder. Why? envy, jealousy. <laughs> Folks, do we ever think those sins will take us to this depth of disgusting choices? No, but it'll happen. If you casually hang on and harbor just anger in your heart, it'll turn into bitterness. If you let that eat your lunch and just consumes you 24-7, you're going to respond in ways that are nowhere close to what a Christian should even think about, let alone do as far as their life in Christ is concerned. So they, again, say, let's kill him. Here comes old dreamer boy. That, again, is not something they really cherish. He goes on to say, Then one said to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, let us slay him. Let's cast him into some pit, and we'll say some evil beast hath devoured him, and we'll see what becomes his dreams. We're going to shut this boy down. Well, Reuben, the older brother, heard it. Thankfully, he had a bit of character in there. And he delivered them out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, that lay no hand on him, that he might rid him out of their hands and deliver him into his father again. Well, here comes Job. You think he was kind of walking around, Oh, it is wonderful to be a Christian. Oh, it is wonderful to be God. He's just rejoicing in his God. And the brothers, full of anger, envy, and bitterness, ready to be even murdered, murderers, here he comes. Look down at verse 23. Well, it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brother that they stripped the Joseph. They stripped Joseph out of it. Don't you think that felt good? I mean, don't you? Can you just kind of sense the fleshly gratification? That was again just, oh, I hate that coat. So again, they stripped him out of his coat, his coat of many collars that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a pit. Now they didn't even know whether it was water in it or not, and the pit was empty, good, and there was no water in it. And they sat down and ate bread and lifted up their eyes. They didn't even care. They grabbed a couple of Big Macs. They're chomping them down. And again, this event's no big deal. Oh, it's a big deal. Why? They're in sin. This is their family member. This is, again, someone they should love, cherish, and honor because, again, he was a testimony that was doing right. But his testimony doing right exposed their darkness. Well, they sat down to eat bread and lift up their eyes and looked and behold a company of Ishmaelites came to Gilead to bear uh, uh, with their camels to bear spicery and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brother, hey, I got an idea. He was kind of a money guy. Do you remember that? Yeah, Judah was a money guy. Judah said, what profit is it if we slay our brethren and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let our hand, this is the most sappy, uh, insincere statement of the whole story. Look what it says. 
He says, let us not, uh, uh, let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. Can we all say, oh, brother? <laughs> I mean, I just an old brother. <laughs> he could care less. And his brethren were content. Well, here comes the Ishmaelites. I just like saying that. It says, and there passed by a Midianite, Midianite merchant man, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. Well, what they have to do, they had covered their tracks, didn't they? So let's finish out the story. It says, down in verse, when Reuben went in in verse 29, unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes. What are you guys doing? And he returned to his brother and said, the child is not, and whither shall I go? And he took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped it in the coat of, of the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors they brought uh, to their father and said, this have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or not. Well, he knew exactly what was going on. And he knew it. He said, it is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without, uh, Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. Now, you know what, folks, I've dealt with a lot of things as a minister of God, whether pastor or evangelist, and one of the most difficult times I've ever dealt with is a family that loses a child. I don't care if it's a baby. I haven't had to bury one of the, uh, actually, a gal I went to school with. Her and her husband were members of, of my church in Portland, Indiana, and he died at the age of 15. One of the most talented, athletic guys, good-looking kid. And again, it, it was just one of the saddest times and hardest things I've ever done in ministry. But here's what we need to ask ourselves. How did things get this bad? You know, just think about it from jealousy to envy to murder to lying to, again, deception, breaking dad's heart. Your son's dead. How low rent do you have to be to have that kind of unconscious, on-purpose representation? How did things get that bad? Well, for those who were with us during Sunday school, and I know there's some new faces here, and some that didn't make it for Sunday school, and I understand how all that works, but I gave them something very important called the rules of communication, and I'm gonna give a little reminder for the newbie folks here tonight. Here's how it happens. Unresolved conflicts. What they do? They didn't deal with today's problems today. No God honoring communication. But here's the bottom line, people, of every mess we get into. Look at me, please. They were not looking to please God. So how do you fix that? Right now, you don't go to certain family members' homes. You're just dreading Christmas is coming because that's the only time you have to put up with them. And there are unresolved conflicts, messed up family relationships that could be fixed through the power and working of God. It may even be in your own home like we see with Joseph. Folks, who are we here for? Who are we looking to please the most? Our rotten flesh? Again, gratifying us instead of glorifying God? You know, it's sad and sorry to say that's kind of the agenda for way too many Christians I know. And they excuse themselves all along the way, just like we see even here through the brothers of Joseph. So how do we put hatred in its place? It's going to be very helpful. I want you to go where we were Sunday morning, Sunday school, and just give a quick reminder. I'm not going to preach it like I did then. But go with me, please, to the New Testament and look at Ephesians chapter 4. And let me just remind you of what I tried to teach even on Sunday, uh, Sunday school uh, this past Sunday. So in Ephesians chapter 4, I gave him what's called four rules of communication. But it's just like any sin. Folks, put it off. Get it out of your life. And that's what we dealt with even in chapter 4, verses 26 and 27, where it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. In other words, it's a problem now. Let's, let's kill it. Let's get it taken care of. 
Because I guarantee you 100% you're going to have more problems tomorrow. And folks, it can stockpile on you. And again, just make you dysfunctional for the will and working of God. As we mentioned, hate the sin, but always love the sinner. Don't give anger a chance, again, to turn into bitterness. But let me show you the right approach to any relationship or situation. Look down with me in verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness. You don't know how bad they hurt me, Brother Ben. You don't realize that I was kind of like the out kid in our family relationship. What's that got to do with you doing right? Remember, Joseph didn't use a bad home life as an excuse to do wrong. And, and you don't want to do the same thing either. I mean, you want to do the same thing. You don't want to do the other like the brother. You don't want to do the same rotten choice of, of again, flesh feeding guys, but you want to have the same testimony of right choosing just like Joseph. Let me read the rest of it here. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, but put away with you with all malice. And, and here's God's will for our lives. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Are you in the forgiving business? How deep, how far should that go? Look back at the verse again. It says, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Aren't you glad he had that kind of love towards you? You who do not deserve that love? Well, they don't deserve that kind of response from me. Oh, you're going to go carnal on us now, huh? You're going to bypass Christ's likeness as far as an unconditional love. You're again going to excuse your way into again responding in a way that hurts the cause of Christ and still again brings glory and honor to his name. I don't care what your excuse or your reason is, it's still wrong and you're in sin. Always looking to make a right choice. What is that? That's just a testimony of integrity. No matter what the circumstances are. No matter how deeply you've been bruised or hurt. No matter how much people irritate you and just greet your ever-loving soul. Just do this. I will do what's right. Would you all say that with me? I will do what's right. That, people, is what's needed today. A testimony of integrity. Let me give you the definition and then we'll have an invitation. Integrity is complete obedience, regardless of who is watching. The intensity of the temptation or the severity of the pressure. I'm not here for me. Whether I'm eating or drinking or whatsoever I'm doing, I'm here to do all to the glory of God. A testimony of integrity. Would you bow your heads and hearts and stand, please? Heads bowed and eyes closed as we stand together. And again, folks, I know you're not real quick to that coming forward sort of stuff. I've been to this, uh, this rodeo before here. But you know what? It's a good thing to respond to in a public way. You don't have to. Again, you can make the same decision there. But folks, just get in the mindset of moving when God says move. And, and, and again, thinking from this perspective, if I respond unashamed, you know what? I may encourage someone else to respond faithfully. That may not be as spiritual minded or, again, an understanding as you might be. So, again, it's not just a thing for us to buy up and enjoy. Yeah, we can worship God in a great way. It's also a time to kick the devil in the teeth and, again, be a ministry unto others. Heavenly Father, help us now as we have this invitation opportunity. Lord, these folks are so easy to preach to. They listen so well. They're so respectful and polite. But God, I pray they weren't just polite. They were participants. That, Lord, they, they really opened their mind and heart to learn the truths of the hour. Lord, I didn't preach this just because. No, I preach this because you have burdened my heart. This is what needed to be preached. And, Lord, if it's one or for all, God, I pray they'll respond again in a way that will honor and please the Lord. 
So Lord, help that one dealing with bitterness. Maybe envy is, is again, just eating them up as far as right testimony is concerned or, or jealousy. Lord, it's amazing in my counseling endeavors and ministry how much of that junk goes on in local churches. Don't let it destroy this church. Oh, God, this people. Tonight, maybe for the first time, or maybe to renew a commitment, they need to commit to a testimony of integrity. No matter what the circumstances of the world may be, no matter what the hurts or the frustrations or circumstances life in general just brings our way, Lord, help us to say, hey, I'm going to do what's right because I'm here to honor and please the Lord. Now, Lord, I, I know this is impossible for someone just to do in, a, in an unsaved state. They don't have you. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And, Lord, they'll never get the victory over this bitterness, this anger, this, again, wrong relationship stuff unless they get the wherewithal of the power and working of you. So, Lord, save that one tonight that needs to be saved, but help us Christians to be very tender to your leading this hour. 